going to discuss here uh, the preoperative guidelines. All right. Ano ba yung mga ginagawa natin before we actually do uh, the surgery for a patient? All right. And that composed of um, a lot of things. All right. Hindi naman tayo bigla bigla na lang pasok sa surgical theater, anesthetize an animal, and then do the surgery. Um, in some cases, yes, that is, the, um, that is the way to do it, especially for emergent procedures. But, more, uh, but most of the surgeries are still done with a certain level of pre-op um, assessment for uh, the, uh, these patients. All right. So when we talk about pre-op guidelines, ano yung mga ginagawa before a surgery? Kaya pre-op. Right? We assess the patient. We determine the surgical risk, if any. We communicate all the information and the, and the decisions that we um, arrive to, to the client. And in, if need be, we stabilize patients. For this lecture, I will be focusing on the first three. Uh, lecture next week, we'll be focusing on patient stabilization, which is a big topic, fluid therapy um, as it is. All right. So pre-op assessment, what do we have to know about a patient, all right, uh, before a surgery, okay? And how do we do it, okay? First, we do history taking, okay? Physical examination, and if need be, we conduct diagnostic tests, right? And I always uh, say this to students, even for clinicians, right? History taking is what the client tells you. Physical examination is what the animal tells you. So kapag um, ang dating kasi sa estudyante, ang magagawa lang nila to collect information is to ask the client, ask the caretaker in the farm, um, ask uh, whoever is taking care of a certain animal. Right? The thing is, that's just a part of all the information that you could gather about an animal. Right, mas uh, mas extensive, of course, ang ang physical examination history taking pagdating sa companion animals as compared to those um, uh, raised in a farm, because the approach for small animals are individual. Um, pagdating sa farm, herd herd wise ang ang approach. So uh, for this uh, lecture, especially for surgery one, I'll be focusing more on dog and cat. Um, because the discussion on the physical examination and pre-op assessment for large animals um, are uh, ay nakalagay or naka-incorporate sa, sa large animal surgery or VSOR 60, if I'm correct. Yeah, VSOR 60. Um, the surgery one focuses more on uh, small animals. Dahil pagdating niyo sa VSOR 55, diretso tayo sa surgery. Hindi na ako discuss ng physical exam, pre-op, and such pagdating sa surgery too. Kaya dito ko siya i-discuss. And, and connected to what I said earlier, it's much more done uh, and much thoroughly done in small animals as compared to food animals. All right? we're, so we're going to discuss this in detail. I would love to hear your uh, insights if you have um, experience in a clinical setting, um, if you are currently volunteering in a clinic or um, just discuss it with me whenever I ask questions or if you have any idea as to uh, the answer to some questions that I will ask, go ahead. I know, um, I, I think uh, a lot of you have uh, pets naman. So makaka, makaka relate kayo dito, all right? My hair is unruly today, so ganyan pag may sakit si Doc, hindi ako naglulugay. All right, history taking. This is the collection of relevant clinical events. All right, so pag sinabing relevant, okay, um, ito lang yung, yung mga itatanong mo. All right, is just related to what you want to know about the animal. And the information that you can get is as good as the questions that you ask. All right, um, and kagaya nung... Um, one TV series that I watch, which is, which is House, everyone lies. So your history taking is, is just as good as your investigative power pagdating sa kliyente. Because um, 
kahit sa clinics pa lang kayo, hindi pa kayo um, nag, nagkakalisan siya, um, you will experience this asking questions from clients and you will catch them in a lie and it's up to you how you're going to get the correct information from them. Right? So what do we ask during history taking? Okay, about um, small animals muna. And this also applies actually in large animals. We have signalment, chief complaint, um, what clinical signs they noticed, um, medical history, um, are they in, are they taking any medications? Are they given any medications? Vaccination history, exercise, diet, environment, sorry, Ooh. environment and owner details. So in history taking, it doesn't just concern your um, patient. All right. You also ask some things that concern the client. Okay? Dahil uh, lalo na kapag companion animals ang pinag-uusapan, ang, ang behavior or ang routine ng kliyente ay very much tied in sa routine ng aso at ng pusa na inaalagaan nila. Right? So what do we ask? Signalment. When I ask for signalment, ito yung basic information about an animal, about a certain patient. So ano ba yung mga basic um, information? The name, the species, the breed, the age, uh, life stage. Uh, oh, sorry, with the age, of course, you're looking for the number of years. For life stage, you would ask if um, is this, uh, in large animals, is this a wiener? Is it, um, is it a breeding animal? Is it a heifer? Is it a dry animal? Is it a lactating animal? So that is included in the signalment. For your sex and neuter status, you have to ask as well, nakastrate na ba to, naspay? Um, when was the last time that um, this female, intact female uh, showed signs of estrus? So that is included with that as well. So diet and appetite, classic question. Kumakain ba? Humina ba kumain? Mas gumana ba yung pagkain? So classic question yan. Even when you are just uh, vaccinating animals, all right, that is one way to assess if they are of a normal health status or not. Uh, you also have to ask um, the state of appetite and any change in diet because a lot of dogs and cats, um, especially if they're not, if they're very picky, some breeds are very picky, there are personalities that are very picky, that they will not eat. Um, when you change the diet, uh, so whenever there's a sudden change in diet, and owners would think that they're sick, pero dahil lang pala dun sa change in diet. That's why whenever we change diets in animals, ideally, you want to do it gradually with, you know, uh, you mix some of the new stuff first with the old stuff, and then gradually um, change it into the, in the new one, okay? Exercise, um, classic. Depends on the species, irregularity, kind of exercise. So these are just basic information that you would want to um, get yourselves into to create a whole picture as to what is happening to your patient, right? Again, um, the result of your history taking is just as good as how good you are of a interviewer, right? Uh, environment, is it living indoors, outdoors, or has access for both? Um, is it the only pet in the house um, for large animals? Is it living in a pen? Is it living individually in shoots? Um, was it recently moved? Um, is it new in the farm? Kakatapos lang ba ng quarantine nito? Um, is there a specific farm location that it's uh, located? And of course, um, madalas hindi na pinapansin, is it from a rural or urban habitat? Right? And that is included in the environment as well. Okay, Vaccination and deworming. Um, in large animals, this is herd health management. Up to date ba ang vaccinations? Kailan binakunahan? Um, for uh, small animals, you also want to talk about parasite control, um, heartworm preventive, very much an important core question for dogs because it's very common. Um, it, it affects your surgical risk so so much that you have to ask um, owners if they are giving heartworm preventives, if they are giving it regularly. Sino ang nagbibigay? Is it them? Is it the doctor or their vet? Is it a handler? So some owners might think you're too nosy, but that's your job. 
and also it is your job na ipaintindi sa kliyente bakit mo kailangan ng mga information na yun. And honestly, when you're in a clinic and there is a lot of uh, owners to ask, uh, you cannot ask all of this. I mean, hindi, hindi, mo siya, hindi kayo pwedeng um, nasa harapan mo siya and then you tick every question in the box. You have to identify what questions are most relevant to what is the chief complaint of your patient. Right? I-prioritize mo na. Lalo na if you're in a high volume clinic na maraming naghihintay or you think this patient is an emergent case wherein you need to prioritize what you need to know first. Kapag namamatay na ang pasyente, I don't expect you to sit down with the owner and ask, kamusta po ang pagkain ng aso sa bahay? All right? That's not, it's, it's, I think that's commonsensical that I don't have to, to teach you how to do that. But as you go along every course, as you train yourselves and develop your foundation as a veterinarian, you will gain that confidence in your surgical judgment and in your clinical judgment to know um, what you need to prioritize as, um, in the clinical setting. For now, don't be worried if you don't know yet kasi hindi pa naman tayo tapos pagdating sa training uh, period nyo. You're still learning. Um, and as you go into your medicine subjects, as you go into your clinics, doon na lang naman yan mag um, incorporate into one another. So right now, it's just for you to gain all this knowledge and expose yourselves to what is re uh, the real situation in the clinical setting. So chief complaint. Always, kapag dumadating ang pasyente sa inyo, um, you're asked for a consult, there's always a problem. Ang laging tanong, unang-una, anong problema? Diba? So, is there a clinical sign that is noticed? When is it first noticed? Is it acute, uh, chronic, or intermittent? Any treatment done to this patient? Um, dinalabas sa vet? Um, nag may, may binigay ba silang parang home remedy for this patient? And after they gave that, did they see any uh, improvement from the patient? All right, so kasama yun lahat. Um, and in every question that you, that you ask, and the client might think na they're guilty, na meron silang hindi ginawa, or nagkulang sila, they will lie. I will tell you that right now. They will lie. So be, be very wary about it. Don't believe everything that they say agad-agad. Of course, that builds trust, but also your your capacity to identify what is a lie and what is it, uh, what is the truth um, that is on you. Na merong mga tao magaling. Ako very confrontational ako nung una. I will tell them you're lying uh, agad agad <laughs> when I was a new vet, and then slowly I I was able to you know improve on my communication skills <laughs> later on. But honestly, it's it's up to us to develop that. So uh, medical history, um, are there any medical issues that were diagnosed before? Um, are there any congenital issues when it was younger? How was it resolved? Um, was it diagnosed with any organ dysfunction, any problems with the kidney or the liver? Um, and you ha also have to ask if there are any medications that this dog or cat are currently taking, right? So. That's all for history taking. It's as how creative as you can be. Um, you just have to identify first. For example, I show you that patient. That is not uh, that is actually not vomiting. It's regurgitating. So, um, sa lahat ng mga tanong na binigay ko kanina, what is your um, first question? Pag dumating sa yung pasyante to actively regurgitating. We'll discuss later what's the difference between vomiting and regurgitation. But for now, dumating ang pasyente, what do you usually ask? The, the client would be like hysterical. Dok, dok, nagsusuka. Nagagawin ko. Uh, what do you ask? And you do this while attending to the patient. You check the patient, you do your physical exam, and then your mouth goes into a tirade of questions. But what is the first question? What do you think? And again, there is no wrong answer. May nakain po bang aso nyo? What else? Yeah, that's a good question, yeah. 
may naka and you have to be specific uh wax you have to be specific may nakain bang iba may nakain bang iba from the routine kumain ba to ng ng pagkain niya kanina okay nasa labas po ba ang aso niyo okay what else what's the activity and what do we mean by activity nasa loob lang ba um nag exercise ba sila and such so you uh, you also need to what do you call this make presumptions for your client that you want to lead them to an answer but you're not answering for them ba lumabas ba kayo nito nag rummage ba to sa basurahan and what is the one question that you hindi ko pa nakikita go but ibato niyo lang sa akin yung questions niya there's one vital question that you have to ask And, and all of that, all of that, may nakain ba, nasa labas ba, anong activity, it depends on this one question that I'm looking for. Be, be uh, creative. Yeah, it's actually, nakagala ba? It, yeah, it's related to that. What else? Good job, Erica. Kailan nag-start? Right? Kailan nag-start ang clinical sign na to? Kailan yung unang napansin. That's correct, Luis. Ngayon lang ba nangyari yan? Alright? So that is actually your first um, what do you call this? First limiting factor. Kapag may nakita ang clinical sign, ang usually yung tanong agad, kailan pa? Kailan pa? Today lang ba? First time ba to today o pangalawang beses na? Kagabi pa ba? Because that will rule out anything that could happen today or that could happen that could have happened yesterday. ba? Diba? So, You have to design a way um, how you ask your questions and the sequence of your questions para hindi, number one, mainis ang kliyente mo. Number two, for you to be able to reach the, the, the important information that could direct you to give treatment or to establish how you're going to diagnose this patient. Because once they say na, ngayon lang nangyari yan, then you could ask immediately, anong nangyari today? You're not gonna be so concerned about what happened yesterday kung ngayon lang to nangyari. Right? So that's how you have to um, navigate your way through a lot of information that could be relevant. Okay? That could be important, but um, will not help you in any way as much as other information would. Right? So we, we can have an exercise later or... Uh, give you an exercise as to give me a list of questions. Sometimes um, I group you into you know groups and then um, role play. Like one is a client, one is a one is a doctor, and then you ask each other. That's a good thing. That's a good exercise. Now physical exam. This is what your patient um, tells you. Okay, dahil madalas. <laughs> So clinician, and I don't blame them for it. I was guilt, uh, I'm guilty for that as well when I was a clinician. Na kapag um, sinabi na sa akin as a doctor, na doc may may consult, nagsusuka, ang tinatanong ko kamusta? Because that's the job of a clinician to establish a his um, a relevant history and for them to do a preliminary PE or a physical exam. But then all they will tell me is. Kompleto po bakuna, kompleto po the warming, kahapon nag-start yung diarrhea. But they ne they will never tell me anything about the physical exam because they never do it. I I I always tell them. That's what the owner said. What does the dog uh, tell you right now? Because that is real time. Yan yung nangyari sa kanya ngayon. The, the patient can't lie. Okay, that's one good thing about being a veterinarian. What you see is what you get. Yes, some species are, are quite difficult to figure out, but that's how you get trained through years of being a veterinarian. Your dogs, the horses, the cow wouldn't lie to you. They would show you um, how it is, except for cats. Cats are, cats are quite temperamental, <laughs> All right? So in physical exam, what do we do? Okay, what do we do? What do we check physically? So this is how you assess the health status of an animal based on the actual evaluation of the body systems, right? So you check the general appearance that includes mentation or the behavior 
uh, body condition, the posture and gait, dehydration status, the vital signs, classic, uh, perfusion indicators, and body systems. Now, vital signs might seem very straightforward. Okay? That's also the first thing that they, they take from you when, you know, when we go to a hospital. They, they take our BP, they take our heart rate, temperature, and such. But honestly, in some, in some clinics that I've seen, they don't even take a heart rate. Because it seems fine, you know, whenever I ask them, don't you take uh, vital signs? Don't you take a TPR? When I say TPR, it's temperature, pulse, respiratory, right? No, 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 it looks fine. But those information, you would want to um, train yourselves na masane kayo na you routinely take those vital signs because, yeah, it might look fine, which is very common, you know, but when you look at the vital signs, there's something that is not right. That's not corresponding um, well with what it's showing me, right? So these numbers might take, uh, what they call it? they're easily collected, they're easily uh, finished, you know, when you collect them. But it, it gives you the better picture because you cannot see the heart, but you can hear it. You cannot see the arteries, you know, delivering the ox the the blood to the tissues, but you can feel a pulse. You know, it gives you an indication of what is happening inside, which you might never see, right? Kaya may vital signs. <laughs> so let's first start with general appearance, right? Um, physical examination, it doesn't start when you touch the animal. It actually starts by you assessing the animal from a distance. Very, uh, what do you call this? Um, very much important for those patients na alam mo magiging fractious or stressed whenever you handle them. Cats, small cat, big cats in wildlife. Um, what do you call this? Uh, general marine life. Uh, what do you, uh, pigs who are very stressed easily, right? So a lot of the physical exam or the assessment of these animals, of these species, are based on assessment from a distance. Right? Uh, what do you check? You check for symmetry. You check for general appearance. What do they look like? Do they look um, well kept? Do they look different from their pen mates? Do they behave differently? Okay. You check its uh, general, uh, what do you call this? Uh, general integument from afar. You'll do a more intensive examination later. For large animals, you could check a symmetry for this uh, cow. Cow, yeah. See, there's a symmetry that's very in indicative of blood, okay? And all that. The so you don't have to touch or you don't have to make excuses. The dog, uh, aggressive yung pusa. Hindi ko siya, hindi ko siya mahawakan. Hindi kita pipilite. Mahawakan na pusa. Uh, so, so that you could give me a physical examination. From afar, what can you check? And check as much as possible, especially for cats. Um, and also, when we do this physical exam, uh, you might see a certain sequence that I have arranged for you. But in the real world, you know, whenever you tell me you don't have um, experience in clinical setting, it's not your fault, of course. But uh, when you go into clinical setting, it's up to you what you first touch. All right? Lalo na kung ano ang unang ipapahawak ng pasyente. If the first thing that you touch is the integument and to check the hair, then that's what you get. If the first thing na una niya ipapahawak sa you would be the limb, then you check. All right? You do not have to tick every um, every box in your checklist strictly. Okay? This is just an overview of what is included in a complete physical exam, how you do it. For every patient, that is up to you. Okay? So mentation. When I say mentation, this is the level of consciousness of your animal. How is it uh, how reactive it is or how responsive it is to its environment or any stimuli that could cause it to, to respond differently, right? So you have four, the basic. Bright, B-A-R, it's always the classic um, note, notation in, in a patient's notes, B-A-R, bright, alert, responsive. Um, you call its name, it, it, it easily answers to you, it easily looks at you. For those who are depressed or lethargic, they would respond to you after 
um, you, uh, you stimulate it even more. You need to touch it. You need to induce, um, for those stupor or abdundant, you need to induce pain for it to respond. It wouldn't call, um, it wouldn't respond to its name. It would just feel so weak and mas gusto niya naka galang. And of course, the worst would be those patients who are non-responsive at all. Uh, at all. Even if you induce pain or if you do, uh, you know, that uh, if you want to stimulate the pain reflexes, like if when you uh, twist, not twist, squeeze the, the nail bed, the, the toenail bed, that actually um, induces pain to the animal and they're not responsive to it, then you could actually have a mentation of squamatose, right? So these things, you don't actually have to touch the animal. All right, but you, you would have an idea already as to the level of consciousness of your animal. And you could narrow down your, your diagnosis already. What could have caused this? Is it an emergent or is it a, is it a normal case? All right? Do I have to check what, um, what diagnostic test do I need to check now to rule out something that's already in my mind? Like, for example, there's a comatose patient that's not responding. You check for glucose immediately. You check for the heart rate. You, you get a, a vitals. I would instantly check for glucose to check if it's hypoglycemic. But that's, again, that is the process that was already, we call this, that I developed in my head as to how I address cases. And as you go, you would be able to design your own style and sequence and how you do things. All right? Body condition. How basically how fat or thin a patient is. Um, there are multiple gradations or score charts that you will see for every animal species and for every company that develops scoring charts, especially for food animals, right? So uh, they're basically in a scale of one to five or one to nine, one being the thinnest, the five or nine being the fattest, and they would have you know, specific anatomical, uh, what they call this, anatomical parameters of, as to how you could say that a patient has good body condition score, has bad, uh, both ways. Is it too thin or is it too fat? Okay? For example, in dogs. Okay? Number five for a one to nine uh, gradation, five over nine is the ideal body weight. Right? You could check the ribs. Uh, for fat cover, for some, whenever they um, call this, they would feel for the ribs. They would put gentle pressure um, on the side of the thorax. That is, uh, what do you call when they could feel the ribs, but there's still adequate fa fat cover. That's a five. Um, kapag nahirapan na silang mafeel yung ribs because ang taba, um, that's usually a nine. So again. Is this strict? Not really. When you look at the, when when I look at the patient, maybe for me it's a five over nine, but maybe for example, uh, Dokiano, that's actually a seven over nine. You know, that's that's you na. That's that's up to you na. You could be so technical about it that you memorize every parameter there is, and you you would still be at odds with someone. <laughs> Na they would argue now, maybe it's a three over five um, instead of a four over five. Okay. But body condition score is, uh, what do you call this, um, interpreted with the entire health status of the animal and the body weight. So, hindi naman ibig sabihin na tipo ang tingin mo, four over five siya. Everything else is scrapped. Everything else is in your mind is scrapped. This is just one of the information that you have to consider later once you have everything in mind okay so um posture and gait what's the difference between the two posture and gait posture is basically um the alignment of the body cavities uh what do you call this um is it straight is there any skewedness to to uh, from the normal body orientation the gait is how it moves right that's the pattern of how someone moves and this one, again, you don't have to touch the animal to assess the posture and gait. There's a lot of, uh, for example, German Shepherds are normally sloping ang, ang hind, uh, ang rump part niyan. For some who are not, um, 
well-versed with the normal appearance of the breeds, they might think that there's a problem with the knees of this animal because it's hyperflexed, but it's actually normal for the breed. For cats, um, commonly, commonly, ha, huh? not everyone, not all cats, commonly from also my experience, affirmed by my experience is that when they flex their necks ventrally, they're feeling something bad, okay? So you check your, <laughs> you check your cats. All right. Whenever there's, uh, whenever they have this posture in a hunched yung shoulders, their neck is uh, pointed down or flexed. Sorry, um, they're actually feeling something bad. They could be feeling pain. Um, a lot of the patients that have had napusa usually look like that. Those with kidney problems, they look like that. It's basically the classic posture for a cat who is not feeling well. So uh, what else? Oh, um, you check for limping. Um, in coordination, abnormal limb placement. This is why pag parating pa lang yung patient, kapag aso, you, all, you already check how it's actually walking towards your, uh, to your clinic or towards the examination room. And also, uh, personal note, you also have to consider the flooring of where it's standing. Dahil uh, like some tiles are so slippery that animals, uh, dogs, basically dogs, especially those stocky uh, ones, you, you think that they're, they have uh, in coordination, pero nadudulas lang pala sila dun sa flooring. So you have to consider those, uh, those things. Whenever you, uh, number one, when you plan out your clinic. <laughs> number two, um, when you assess these patients. Right? Kaya mas maganda, ina-assess ang gate in a carpeted setting or sa or sa cemento na sa labas usually that's the um, that's the way one thing as well dami kong sinisingit uh, for example the patient is indoors okay uh, the patient lives indoors sana siya sa sahig um, but then pinalakad mo siya sa cemento they might not want to and you think there's something wrong pero yung pala sa change lang na environment so so again you this how you decide on how you're going to get these information and get your animals tested is up to the basic information that they have provided to you, right? Um, hunched body, leaning slightly. These are, you know, some um, postures that are abnormal that could point you to a certain diagnosis. Licking of lips is um, a sign for patients that are anxious or nervous. Some are in pain. Uh, excessive licking of lips, though, could be a sign of nausea. Nahihilo, gustong sumuka. And exaggerated yawn is usually for them to release tension. So these are just some things. There's a lot of pictures online. There's a lot of videos online as to how uh, you can assess these animals. Hydration status, which I will be focusing more on, on the next lecture. Okay. Animal body is composed of greater than 60% water. It, why I said greater than 60? Because it depends on the age. Um, ano bang mas mataas ang total body water? Matanda o bata? Bata. <laughs> Younger, yes. Younger animals, neonates for one, have a higher uh, total body water. That's why their skin are more elastic. Older would have less elastic skin. That is the basis of including the assessment of skin trigger or tenting to be an, indi um, an indication for skin elasticity, right? You, this is the measure of how quickly the skin returns to normal position after you extend it. So you pinch a part of the skin, right? Usually these, um, saan part ng body, okay? Saan part ng body, you usually go for the places where there is slightly loose skin, yung hindi banat na banat sa... Uh, part ng pasyente, okay? You pull it back, and then you count the number of seconds. Uh, sorry, you pull it back, you let it go, and then you count the number of seconds um, the skin takes for it to return to the patient's body. And if your animal is well hydrated, that is instantaneous. That is less than a second. So you could try it on yourself. When you pinch your, 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 um, your skin, you, uh, you count the seconds, all right? Um, and I hope that's it in instantaneous, right? And also, um, I, I actually tried this before when I was learning. I tried it uh, on my dogs as well. 
uh, and on my cats, my cat didn't like it though, no, because I, I, I tried to practice everything that I learned <laughs> to my pets. So you could try it as well. You could have a rough estimate as to um, is the hydration status of this animal bad or good, right? Because if that um, skin does not come back to its normal position um, in matter of an instant seconds, you know, instantaneously, it might be um, bordering to a level of dehydration in it, right? I will be focusing more on that in fluid therapy. Okay, next week, prepare your scientific calculators. Your phones would do as a calculator, that's fine. But we're going to do a lot of computations for that. Vital signs, right? Um, again, when you do your physical exams, medical history, you could be doing this at the same time. The patient is usually weighed immediately pagdating pa lang sa um, clinic. Uh, what else? Temperature, heart, pulse rate. RR and perfusion indicators. We'll discuss this one by one. Body weight. Okay. Again, first thing that you that your assistant should do whenever a patient is um, is uh, or whenever a patient arrives in your clinic is check the body weight. Right. One thing though, um, for those animals that you think are weighing less than ten kilos, or when the, you put them in the big scale, they weigh ten kilos. You have to confirm that with a pediatric or small scale. Um, there are two scales, na pwede sa bata or pwede sa less than ten kilos. You could have the normal baby scale, yung tabletop na pang baby, right? And the other one would be yung pang bigas, right? Yung pang palengke. Yes, that is used as well. And that is actually very accurate to the grams, all right? The challenge for them is for them to, to stay still while you are uh, measuring the body weight. But that is just one thing because the big scales, yung nakalagay sa floor, kagaya ng nasa picture, they are usually not as accurate as the small scales for those animals weighing less than 10 kilos, okay? Um, any animals below three kilos or above 35 kilos must be examined thoroughly for surgical clearance. Um, care is taken um, very seriously for those who are weighing less than three and more than 35. Um, not because of the BCS, not because of um, the possibility that they're too thin or too small or too, or too uh, fat, but it's because of the, you have to think about the anesthetic clearance for them. For small animals, they're very prone to get overdoses. For 35 kilos, you have to check, is it, um, do they weigh that much because of fat? Or are they really that big, right? Because you also have to consider that when you create your anesthetic plan. The, th the temperature um, accurately obtained with a rectal thermometer. So whenever you, when you, whenever you go out during these times, and they, you know, they point that thing into your head, whatever, to get your temperature. That's not really accurate. But you know, that, that's what they want. Unless you want to be, unless gusto mong gamit ka na rectal thermometer, di ba? But that, that's what works. So um, since this is uh, taken with um, putting that thermometer inside the bum of the animal, you could guess that this is not something that you do initially okay hindi po yan ang unang ginagawa sa pasyente actually um why it stresses them a lot it is some for some it induces pain number two ayaw na nilang magpahawak which actually compromises your entire physical exam plan dahil sa temperature pa lang naging aggressive na siya so usually hinuhuli ko yan um especially if i don't think that the temperature is actually abnormal or it's not pointing to anything that is low temp or too high temp, okay? Because when your patient is very low temp, na, how do they call this? Very mababa na worrisome, your patient will not be bright, alert, and responsive, right? If it's so high, like more than 40s, your patient will not be bright, alert, and responsive as well. So this is how you incorporate every information together on how, how you prioritize things. Kapag yung mga for vaccination, I think they're okay physically as, as I see them by general appearance. And temperature, pinapahuli ko. Especially if I want the students to be well-versed with physical exam and the patient is very much um, 
cooperative. I would want them to 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 examine the patient for every for all the body systems before they do temperature para walang risk na maging aggressive yung animal or maging stressed your animal whenever they touch it because when you do temperature first they will think that whenever you try to touch them again you will put things up their bum right so ayun na nila magpahawa so it's just how you plan things and what are the challenges i think i just discussed that though what are the challenges with temperature readings the normal for dogs and cats it depends on the literature um especially right now and daming literature <laughs> um but my classic uh, thinking is 38.5 to 39.5 i would i could actually go to 37.9 especially if you are in a place which is colder okay pag nagtanong ka ng vet sa bagyo at nagtanong ka ng vet sa maynila magkaiba ang normal readings niyan for for me my my reading is like 37.9 and that's still normal especially for cats 37.8 37.6 that's fine they're not hypothermic for me um but if they go to 36 37.1 um there might be something wrong right heart rate look at that cute dog right this is the the measurement of the cardiac mechanical function which is beats per minute usually with a stethoscope right the normal heart rate for these uh animal species would be dogs 70 to 120 Cats much higher, 160 to 220. This is one thing that I will. What's the normal heart rate for us? Biglang nag feel ng puso ay na. Ano ang normal heart rate ng tao? It's less than it's less than 70 actually. Unless you're you're a diver, right? This is the trick. Right? Whenever you have a lot of animal species that you want to examine. So the smaller the animal, the higher the heart rate. The bigger the animal, the lower the heart rate. Normal, ha? Like cats. Normal is around 200. Mawawala na nga yan sa pagbibilang mo eh. Basta mabilis. Pagdating sa horse, it's usually 40s, 50s. Right? That's the trick. The bigger the body, the lower the normal heart rate. Right? So what could increase the heart rate? Excitement, pain, shock. Uh, shock is a hyperdynamic state, meaning there's, uh, what do you call this? You have a high volume or there's a big requirement across your periphery for more blood flow. That's why your heart rate would compensate for that. Cardiac pathologies, of course, is there a need for the heart to pump more? Lower heart rate, of course, you have hypothermia because your heart would want to keep the blood within the core uh, areas there. Kaya nagnalamig yung uh, extremities, hypothyroidism, increased vagal tone, cardiac pathology, specifically with the conduction or the electrical uh, aspect of your heart rate. Now, uh, before that, when do we usually get heart rate? Uh, we usually get heart rate when a patient is very calm or when you can. Again, um, accurately, you would want to use your stethoscope for it. You would want to hear it. And not just the heart rate, you would want to hear the quality of that heart rate. And as you we move further, you will hear what it actually sounds like. Um, but sometimes, especially for cats, they wouldn't let you do it. <laughs> um, they wouldn't want you to move them in any way. So especially for cats, you have to find the best way to... Um, do your physical exam. Following their, the bat, taking care of cats is actually a lesson for consent. That's why a lot of people don't like cats because they don't like to be rejected. Um, but uh, kapag, kung nasa ang position, komportable ang pusa, dun ka lulugar. Huwag mo siyang pipilitin na kakargahin, na hawakan, i-restrain because that heart rate could go higher than 250. And that's just because of stress. Right? So, when you're checking the heart rate, you have to identify what is stress-induced, what is not. And it's also on your end on how you would um, minimize the possibility that the vital signs that you got is because of stress that they experience in your own handling. Okay. So aside from, for example, nawawala si stethoscope, how can you measure heart rate in, oh, in small animals? What is another way? Just actually usually done for puppies, for cats. 
and what's funny is whenever whenever I uh, show this to clinicians, they were like, "Pwede pala yon. Actual palpation, correct. Actual placing of your hand across the chest of the animal and feel for the heart rate. For, feel for the heartbeat. And that's easily done for cats. You know, you think you you know you're just hugging them. You could actually feel their heart, uh, their heartbeat. For puppies, whenever you carry them and you're like gushing all over them, I'm cute and puppy. You could actually take the heart rate already. So this is one way for you to um, do things. Na you're being thorough, but you don't look it. You know, you, you're getting all this information, but the owner was is still uh, distracted by how you ask questions and such because you have to be efficient but you also have to be accurate in whatever you do so for those who have stethoscopes you could practice this on yourself <laughs> and your pets on how you, how to auscultate there are two parts of a stethoscope um the big you know the big part here would be the diaphragm the upper part would be the bell or the small one so um what how i use this is that the bigger one the bigger circle the diaphragm is what I use for like bigger patients. Um, some have said that um, that's what you use for heart and the bell is what you use for lungs. But I find that, um, yeah, it works. Yes, um, I've seen some literature about that. But usually I, I also use the bell. I also use the bell for small animals. Kapag, uh, even for uh, those laboratory animals that I need to check heart rate, that's what I use the bell. And you actually could turn it on and off. Para yung maririnig mo rin with the bell is the heart rate. Practice it with your uh, with your pets. Um, ideally, you auscultate them in a standing position. Then again, that could be flexible. And commonly, the sounds of the lungs, okay, whenever they breathe, would occlude the sounds of the heart, especially if that patient is quite fat, right? So you could control the respiratory sounds by transiently, uh, yeah, transiently holding the mouth close, segment lang, or you occlude the nostrils, for, for example. Okay. So where do you actually put your stethoscopes? Um, there are four main areas. Um, if you are well versed, or you would want to be like a veterinary cardiologist, you would want to um, auscultate specific valves in the heart of the animal. So the first one is the mitral valve. Mitral left sided, um, you point it into the left of fifth intercostal space. And the common way for this is you just hold a flex, the elbow to the back, and kung san pupunta yung point ng elbow, that's where you put your uh, stethoscope. The aortic valve would be around that area as well. You don't have to memorize that. I just wanted you to see where you actually look and where it corresponds to the actual heart of the animal. And of course, the last valve, which is found on the right, is what valve? The counterpart of mitral. It's really there, though. The tricuspid, it's usually the point of the shoulder, or just behind the scapula of the animal. Great. I don't know if this will be heard. I'll try to max it out. What's max? The normal heart sounds? All right, so um, I always tell students um, how you would know what is normal is how much you listen to normal before you listen to the abnormal. Kaya lagi kong sinasabi, take advantage of your pets if you have pets or you know any animal that's close to you if you're, or if you're volunteering in a clinic right now, listen. Do, do all your physical examinations. Take advantage of that opportunity para masana yung tenga nyo sa kung ano ang normal, kung ano ang hindi. Whatever, there's a lot of videos online that are actually accurate as to, uh, like this, to mimic the normal heart sounds. And then whenever you hear something that is different from what you are usually, um, what you are used to hearing, then you can figure out, may mali, may iba, right? Kasi hindi nyo malalaman kung ano yung 
this is something that you cannot memorize. This is something that you, you know, someone could tell you that there's something wrong, pero sa, sa tenga mo, hin, normal lang. That's through experience. That's through your own training of your own ear to um, to know what is normal and abnormal, right? Of course, uh, mentorship would help a lot. That's how I learned as well. I don't even know what a heart murmur um, sounds like when I was in college. Um, whenever they say, this is in congestive heart failure, all I hear is fluid. I can't even hear a heartbeat. So I didn't know what is and what is not. And that takes a lot of um, finding uh, a good mentor who will teach you stepwise. Kasi hindi naman tayo lahat... Um, uh, what do you call this? Kahit gano kagaling mag <laughs> honestly, whenever you're in a clinical setting, you're back to a blank slate. You have to learn everything again. Pulse rate would correspond, of course, with your heart rate. And when you assess the pulse rate, right, you also have to check how strong it is. And um, when you check the heart, uh, the pulse rate, you also have to check for the symmetry. If you check for the le left one, you have to check for the right one as well. And they should match. Kaya usually, ang pulse rate sa mga pasyente, kinukunan niya ng sabay. For example, this guy is um, collecting a pulse rate from the femoral artery, from the femoral triangle on the inguinal part, medial side of the thigh of a dog. So you, should, you could get pulse rate from that part first and then get um, pulse rate on the right side. But what I do is just position my, you know, my two fingers on the medial side ng sabay para ma-assess ko siya ng sabay. Alright? Dahil kailangan sabay sila. <laughs> Kapag hindi, may mali. Alright? And also, the heart rate that you collected should match the pulse rate because that is the peripheral version of it. Your heart pumps that is actually carried by the circulatory system. So it should match your heart rate. If not, there's a pulse deficit and there's a problem with your circulatory system. And that is usually much more complicated than what you think. Because they could have a pulse deficit and they look fine, right? Um, uh, this is what I said. You check the left artery, it should match the right. So where do we usually get pulse rate? Commonly is the femoral artery, this cat here. Um, where else? Do you think they have that thing here that we have on the medial side of our of our wrist? Where else do we get pulse rate from from animals? We did this in fish, all right, right? Where else? Any guess? Tampa ba sila may artery, guys? So artery kina ko ang pulse rate ha. Tampa ba sila may artery? na superficially placed para ma ramdaman mo. Diba? Inguinal? Yeah, but um, we call this. Imagine the anatomy of your we call it, anatomy of your dog, ha? <laughs> May tawa, wax. Uh, imagine the anatomy of your dog, ha? Yes, there is that big brachial artery there. Yeah, really good artery. But the thing is, there is a lot of muscles covering that. You have the pectorals in that area. You have the serratus ventralis there. You have the big part of your um, um, triceps brachii covering that. So, nakakonceal siya. Hindi mo siya masyado maramdaman. So, you have to, to check those arteries na superficially placed. Is there a jugular artery wax? Papa. The vein. You're thinking of carotid here? Again, that is covered. Your the carotid of uh they call this um the carotid of their small animals. Yes, they're in a sheath, but they are covered by what? Your brachiocephalicus, your omotransversarius, um, a part of your omohyoidus. So that's covered again. So you usually go for other parts. So again, review and anatomy. Anatomy and surgery. Uh, walks hand in hand. The dorsal fetal artery is what is positioned here. Remember when uh, you need, when you do your uh, what do you call this dissections. Okay, you have the cephalic vein that divides here, right? 
And then you have your artery there. The artery would go to the corpus and the metacarpus. And they would divide there. So dito, wala nang muscle dyan. Okay? So mararamdaman mo actually sa mga pasyente that they have a pulse on that area. Sa taas ng po nila. Just on the junction, sa corpus. That's the dorsal fetal artery. And of course, on the tail, the caudal sacral artery. Dahil again, wala nang muscle dyan. So these are uh, some areas. Of course, horses would have the big transverse facial artery that runs through the lateral rims of its um, of its uh, maxilla. What else? They have big dorsal pedal arteries as well. So again, these are areas na call this. Hindi ganon ka muscle. The femoral artery is a exemption because the femoral triangle gives you a big window where in and the femoral artery vein and nerve. And dun palang nagsis merong window <laughs> between those uh, muscles that could give you a good pulse rate with the femoral artery. Respiratory rate and depth. Okay, when you assess respiration, it is not just about the number of breaths uh, uh, an animal takes, it's how deep or how effortful um, they are when they are breathing. All right. So when it, when um, whenever you see a patient, okay, you assess them when they are at rest, okay. And this is something that you could actually assess during general appearance for um, clients na pabalik balik na sa inyo or merong existing cardiac or respiratory problem. You have to tell your clients to take a resting RR. Yung kapag natutulog ang pasyente, kapag at rest ang patient sa bahay, that's when they count the respiration so that uh, you could actually see it na comfortable, non-stressed. Dahil kapag nasa clinic, lagi yung mataas. Right? But that's one thing. Whenever a patient is has high respiratory rate pero shallow yung depth, meaning hinihinga lang, that's the tipnia. Right? Pero kapag mataas ang RR, mataas din ang respiratory depth. Okay? Yung, yung humahagod talaga siya ng breath, tapos mabilis. <laughs> that's hyperventilation and that's different from tachypnea. Alright? That's a different pathology with it. Alright? So what's the normal resting RR? Dogs is 12 to 40. Whenever they are in a clinic, that could go up to an 80. Kapag mainit, that could also go up. So you have to con uh, consider all these factors that are um, exogenous or outside of the animal that could affect it. Para makita mo na, is it a, there's is there something wrong with the lungs or is it just because it's hot? Right? Mucous membrane color might be quite difficult to assess in cats because they have limited area of the lips that you could lift as compared to dogs who just wants to slobber on everything. But this is uh, one way for you to assess the perfusion, okay? What do we mean by perfusion? This is how um, good the circulatory system is in delivering the oxygen that is needed in the tissues, right? Remember, ano ang silbi ng puso, right? Um, it's to pump. Imagine the circulatory system as a plumbing system, all right? Yung tanke, okay, yung motor, would be the puso. Yung tubo would be the arteries and veins. Yung tubig would be the dugo, right? So for that blood to reach its destination, it needs to be pumped well enough for it to reach it at that certain rate, okay? And for you to assess how good it is, because you cannot see how, you, you can count the heart rate, you can count the pulse rate, but you cannot see if it's actually working. Because the heart rate could work as a conduction, diba? it could work na naririnig mo yung heartbeat, but it might not be filling enough, it might not be emptying enough. So this is uh, an easy way for you to check. Um, mucous membranes would be gums, conjunctiva, uh, the vulva or the previous, the anus as well. right? So you check if it is with the normal color. Okay? and normal degree of moisture. Okay, so dor the normal would be pink mucous membranes. If you look at your conjunctiva, you look at your gums, it should be pink, okay? Um, 
One uh, bad thing would be if they are bluish or cyanotic. Yes, yeah, it's cyanotic. Okay, that means kulang yung dugo na pumupunta doon or mali yung formula ng hemoglobin na pumupunta doon. Because there could be hemoglobin going there, but it could be in a methemoglobin uh, for, uh, format, which is bad because it cannot carry oxygen. What else? They could be yellowish or icteric, which could mean that there is a problem with a lot of things. Actually, I will not, I will not be um, specific with what could cause a yellow mucous membranes because there's a lot. Okay? Particularly the liver, the kidney could also cause this because there's overflow of bilirubin, which should be excreted um, out. But in turn, it is um, it backflows into the circulatory system. Kaya siya yung nade-deliver sa tissues, kaya siya dila. Which could happen in a lot of uh, pathologies. Uh, and of course, pale. Okay? Basically, white. Black in color. Uh, white in color. And that... Um, Whenever they are dehydrated as well, the moist, shiny appearance. When you touch your gums, they're actually wet, diba? Right? Not because of saliva, it's just because it's how perfusion goes. Um, whenever you have patients that are weak, now bluish, cyanotic, or pale, when you feel their gums, it's uh, malaget or parang very dry na rin siya. It's also a bad thing. Now, exemptions to the rule, of course, <laughs> because they want to make our jobs even way harder than it is. Um, some breeds have pigmented mucous membranes because some would think, ah, it's necrotic, it's black, doc. No, it's just how it is. Okay, they have pigmented um, mucous membranes. It's normal for them to have that. And also presents a difficulty or a challenge for us to, to uh, detect because you cannot see. For some chow chows, the entire gum would be black, so you cannot actually use it to assess perfusion. So you go for other mucous membranes that you could actually see. Like for a male, the inside of the prepuce, for the female, the vulva, it's rarely uh, pigmented for that, usually the gums. And of course, uh, Weimaraners, Weimaraners, yeah, um, would have normal brick red, um, what's called this, mucous membranes, because you might think na hyper, uh, hyper perfusion, masyadong madami <laughs> uh, yung blood na pumapasok dito. So, which is actually a, a sign of a hyperdynamic state, like anaphylaxis and such, la la la. You'll learn this in pathology. And, um, sorry. And um, that is normal for, for way mariners, also for horses. It's actually normal. So, capillary refill time. Okay. Capillary refill time. What is a capillary? The smallest um, portion, the smallest segment of the entire circulatory system. This is where gas exchange happens. So, ito yung dapat mabilis na nare-refill. <laughs> All right? So, how do you do this? Along with mucous membrane evaluation, you blanch or you put gentle pressure on um, the gums or mucous membrane. And then you wait. You count the number of seconds um, it takes for that area to become pink again. The normal would be less than two seconds. Again, whenever you don't have dogs, practice it on yourselves. Look at a mirror, lift your uh, lift your lips. Um, what uh, diinan nyo yung gums nyo, then suddenly release it. Then you count how many seconds it takes for the capillaries in your mucous membranes to um, refill or mag uh, fill ulit ng blood. It should be less than two seconds. Again, it should be instantaneous as well. Okay? Pag matagal, ibig sabihin, there's low perfusion. Matagal, dumating ulit doon yung tugo. Okay? Sorry. Um, okay. After all that, now we could examine body systems. Um, again, this is the most systematic. This is the most thorough that you could get. Um, you do not have to do everything this way. And sometimes you have to prioritize what you have to do first or if you're going to finish this later. So that is up to you. But basically, you check everything. So head and neck, entanglement, limbs, thorax, element. So I'm just going to go through this quite fast. Okay. The skull, when you check the skull, you assess the shape and the symmetry of the skull. Very much important as well for a horses wherein they get, um, it's very common for them to get problems in the nasal turbinates. 
Sometimes it's enlarged, sometimes it's not. It's also for dogs, they get enlarged salivary glands over here. So you could actually see if there's um, inflammation or a mass that needs to be checked out just because of the symmetry of the skull. The eyes, examine them separately. Um, is there any um, deviation from the normal position? Is there any abnormal movement of the eyes? Um, you check the pupil size. Um, if there's an even, dahil dapat, mag, uh, da, dapat pareho ang size ng pupils niyan. If not, that's called anisocoria. Anisocoria, favorite term. Uh, you check the vision, of course. Um, madalas, maraming, uh, what do you call this? De developmental cause ng pagiging blind. Yung tipong, sorry, progressive blindness. The owners wouldn't actually detect it. They wouldn't be able to notice it because the patient has been used to what the house looks like. So kahit nabubulag siya, they know where to turn, they know where furniture is, and they will only show signs of blindness when they are put in a different environment. So that's one thing. Reflexes, so there's a lot of reflexes you could check. Menace, uh, palpebral, uh, pupillary light reflexes. Um, you also check the eyelids. Again, you just check everything, and whenever um, something is wrong, then that's, what you, that's where you move one step further to identify what it is. Ears, the pinna must move, actually. Um, very important, you must check for any discharge. Um, abnormal smell. For some that, ha uh, that have severe otitis, um, inflammation of the ear, okay? Ear canal, sorry, inflammation of the ear canal. Um, pagpasok pa lang ng pasyente na amoy mo na agad na may problema to sa tenga. Okay? You check for signs of inflammation. I hope you still remember the cardinal signs of inflammation. Five, cardinal signs of inflammation. You're done, you're done with immuno, right? Answer me. <laughs> Are you, I know you're, you're, I know some of you are done with immuno at least. Uh, 12 people that I know. Redness, okay. Inflammation, swelling. What else? You're lacking two, Louise. What else? Heat. Last one. Last one now. <laughs> oh, pain? And, yeah, pain. But there's another one. Sorry. Pain. Um, lots of function. Okay. Then you're right there, Mark, loss of function, but it's also um, impaired function as well. It function lays out less function. Hindi naman siya agad nawawalan ng function. So it's usually impaired function. So that's good. Good, good, good. Nostrils, you check for shape symmetry again. I'm just, um, what do you call this, outlining to you what you actually need to check. And then again, once you gain experience, isang tingin pa lang, you usually have an idea already. For discharges, which is common if it's in the eyes, ears, nostrils, you have to classify the discharge. Is it serous, mucoid, mucopurulent, or hemorrhagic? Oral cavity might be a challenge for those fractious animals. Usually, uh, ginagawa ko to kapag ang, ang pusa ay naghihis because they open their mouth. <laughs> so, I actually check it already. <laughs> Uh, whenever they do that. But if you want to do a more thorough one, especially if an animal is showing signs of something wrong in the mouth, if you need to sedate your animal, sedate them. Right? Um, just for you to check what's inside. Dahil baka nandun naman ang problema, takot na takot ka mag-sedate, bigay ka ng bigay ng anti-emetic or whatever when you could, ha you could have just removed a foreign body in there with a simple sedation. Right? So you check the with membranes, uh, check the teeth, and check the tongue. Right? And of course, very common with cats, um, brachycephalic dogs, shih tzus, pugs, you check the mandible for any crepitus because sometimes they won't eat. Yung pala may fracture na sila sa mandible. Crepitus is the cracking sound 
of bones whenever they're broken or uh, yeah, whenever they're broken. So I know you know the sound of that, <laughs> all right? Try to break a, I don't know, a chicken wing into two or something. Let's scrap it us, okay? <laughs> um, <clears throat> sorry. One important thing about cats, kaya important na i-check yung oral cavity nila, is that sorry, <laughs> they are they're very um, prone for foreign bodies, especially linear foreign bodies. Okay? They like to play with yarn. They like to play with the ribbons or ropes. And whenever they suddenly eat that, okay, a part of that actually loops below their tongue. So that's one way for you to know, actually, if there's a foreign body inside before it actually becomes worse. Okay, lymph nodes, classic, um, well, this uh, thing that we check, we check for symmetry, we check if it's palpable. The mandibular lymph nodes here would be the orange one below the mandible there. Looking for the annotate. Oops, sorry. This one here would be the mandibular lymph node. This is the mandibular salivary gland, all right? So you just have to know what is uh, palpable and what is not. Ano ang, ano ang symmetry ng left and right? Dahil dapat um, pantayan. Okay, trachea. You can actually palpate for the trachea. That's You can actually um, feel for the tracheal rings there. Kahit may mga muscle dyan. Um, you could gently squeeze it. That could actually um, induce a reflex wherein they cough, the cough reflex. Thyroid gland, only palpable when enlarged. Um, you actually just trace the trachea and then it slips right through your fingers whenever you feel for them. But they're not as, um, they're more, uh, mas chine check sila sa pusa dahil mas prone ng pusa sa hyperthyroidism than dogs. Okay, neck movement, very common in patients who are, uh, they call this, showing signs of pain whenever they move, right? Dapat walang pain whenever you try to flex the neck dorsally and laterally. And whenever there's pain, of course, they would just suddenly bite you and that's a risk, but that's our job, <laughs> right? The integument, this is easily, easily uh, checked. But one thing that is always, you know, dismissed, um, lagging yung dorsal area lang yun na check, yung lateral, the ventral not so much, and you have to um, assess that as well, not just for um, not just for parasites, alopecia, and all of these pathological conditions, but especially for puppies um, who love to just pee and then lie on it. <laughs> All right, and then they get that puppy dermatitis, you know. So you have to check this area as well. So for female dogs, that also includes you checking the mammary gland. Check for any masses, check for any um, asymmetry as well, or any supernumerarities. Okay, uh, thoracic pelvic limbs. Basically, you're checking movement, the gait, check the joints, check for any pain. Whenever you're holding it, actually, if it has... Um, pain or if it has arthritis, it would show signs of pain. Either bite you or not. <laughs> just how it is. Uh, nail beds are very much home for picks, for wounds, for cysts. So make sure that you check the nail beds, you know, the foot pad and the interdigital uh, areas of the pulse. Yes, it might seem so taxing whenever you're taking care of patients. But, you know, you don't want something that the owners will see at home and then they will blame you for not being thorough and not seeing that. There's, there's a lot of clients like that. So, mas madaganda ng pinaghintay mo na you're thorough kasi naman balikan ka because of that. So, um, there's a lymph node in the scapula that you could actually feel sometimes. You have the superficial uh, cervical lymph node and then the one um, lymph node on the pelvic limb. Oh, that's good. At least someone's answering me, diba? The popliteal. The popliteal uh, lymph node. Right, thorax. Uh, you observe the respiration. Oh, you also can palpate the thoracic cage. You check for symmetry and integrity. 
um, very important for patients you think that underwent trauma. Right, auscultation and that. So for lung sounds, the thorax, usually soft, breezy, rustling sounds. Uh, you could, uh, we'll listen to this later, right? But the panting in dogs would be the one masking lung and airway sounds, the purring in the cat, uh, mask the sound. So one way you could control that would be hold one finger over one or both nostrils. Um, you could wave an alcohol soaked cotton near the cat's nose to actually induce it to smell para isa lang. Hindi siya yung, hindi siya ganun. All right? Para, kasi pag ganun yung respiration ng pusa, nag, what do you call this? Nag, uh, nagbablock or it distracts you from the main long sounds. And you could distract it by turning a sound on around its patient. So what is the normal sound of a lung? All right. So that's just a normal lung sound. Okay. Again, how you are, uh, what do you call this? How you are, how you identify the normal from the abnormal takes time. Okay. Misan obvious, misan hindi. And that's fine. Right. Unless you're a pulmonologist, you know, I don't blame you if you miss something. Bronchial lung sounds, uh, some blockages or small blockages into the bronchus could actually cause this loud, high-pitched sound wherein mahirap yung pag-inhale at exhale ng pasyente dahil nahihirap ang pumasok at lumabas yung hangin from the small bronchial trees of the uh, lung. So weeds would be have music on um, a horror movie. Yeah, they're dying when, when this happens. Uh, sorry, asthma does this actually. All right, crackles interrupted. So again, so again, you always um, connect this with what you're seeing in the animal, right? Because when you look at this, uh, when you see this uh, crackles, Sometimes it uh, sounds like a normal lung sound, right? Abdomen, um, all this. You should do abdominal palpation if the animal um, permits you to, right? You check for pain. Um, they would usually hunch or they would flex their abdominal muscles and you would feel that it's harder for you to palpate when there's pain. Number, uh, number two, they would just cry out. Number three, they would be aggressive to you. You could actually assess organ size and location as well. Because again, you know what's in the left side, what's on the right side. And as you do a lot of abdominal palpations, mas nasasana ka na kung anong feeling ng spleen, anong feeling ng intestines, anong feeling ng bladder. Abdominal distension is usually caused by um, either of the five Fs, right? Fat, fluid, feces, foreign body, or flatulence. Uh, foreign body includes uh, fetuses, right? Because basically they're foreign bodies. <laughs> okay, uh, what are the palpable versus non-palpable organs in a normal animal? Intestines are palpable if feces are present. Um, bladder, if they have adequate contents, part of the left kidney. Both kidneys in cats are palpable, so if you could actually feel it, it's normal. Liver, pancreas, stomach, adrenal glands, uh, some, sometimes the spleen can be felt, but commonly they are not, right? The uterus cannot be palpated unless it is gravid. Either it has uh, kids inside or it has pus, right? <laughs> so position variation is very common in cats because you work with how they want you to work, right? Kung gusto nilang maglakad, susunod ka. Kung gusto nilang karga sila, kakargahin mo sila as you do the physical examination. It's how you adjust to your patient. General urinary genital area for the male to check if the testicles are symmetric and they are completely descended. 
you can check the penis um, by exteriorizing it from the previous, check for any signs of trauma, masses, confirmation of abnormality, kung kaya bang ilabas yung buong penis or not, phimosis, paraphimosis. For the female, you check the vulvar area. Again, pretty much self-explanatory. Now, after you have done all those, history taking, physical examination, you would have an idea as to the physical uh, status of the animal, right? And th there is a way to quantify that, right? The worse the physical status of an animal, the higher the risk of the patient surgically and um, because of anesthesia. And that could be quantified, right? It could be falling in some categories from one, two, three, four, five. And these are just examples of that. Okay, examples of surgical procedures that could um, put your animal's condition into that. Again, is there a way to accurately do this? Is there always um, a specific way to know that that's uh, physical status three, physical status four? Not really. This is just, uh, you know, the ideal way of doing this. Diagnostic tests, lastly, um, help you um, be more thorough as to identifying any health problems of the animal. For example, cheesecake. Totally, uh, totally just made up a name. <laughs> right, three-year-old intact female ragdoll cross presented for an elective spay, right? So your usual diagnostic test for that, blood test, would be a complete blood count and a renal profile, right? For you to know if there is any infection that this patient is currently fighting, and if the kidneys are good enough to metabolize um, anesthesia, right? It has uh, clearance because most, it's not most anesthetics um, undergo clearance with the kidney, but a lot of the toxins do. And you're going to be pumping a lot of fluids into the patient's body during surgery. So you want to make sure that the kidney is good in clearing that fluid out. Um, as compared to Rio, which is a 10-year-old castrated male, just presented for an emergency splenectomy. When we say splenectomy, what do we mean again? We are removing the spleen, okay? To be because of a tumor and such. And by appearance, Rio looks worse. So you might need a lot more, right? A complete CBC, sorry, CBC biochemical profile. Um, another indication of renal uh, ability or renal function would be your analysis as well. Okay, so what are the diagnostic blood tests? Some of these you have experienced already in uh, Fischl, I think. Okay, the pack cell volume and total protein, which measures the amount of RBC in the blood and the total amount of protein in the blood. Uh, the complete blood count, which includes RBC, WBC counts, uh, hemoglobin, and platelet counts. Renal profile and urinalysis is just quantification of the renal enzyme levels, including electrolytes um, in the blood and the PCV and TP. Usually that gives you a big um, picture or very good picture already of the renal function of the animal. Yeah, sure, renal profile. And the biochemical profile would assess everything, liver, kidney, electrolytes, and not just um, sodium, potassium, uh, Chlor not, not chloride, calcium, but a lot of other electrolytes, right? So when you go into clean path, right, you'll know what all of these uh, would indicate already. If it's low, if it's high, if it's normal, that's the subject um, of clean path is about, right? For imaging, okay, the other one is blood. This one is imaging, okay? You could take thoracic radiographs, uh, abdominal radiographs, a TFAS and AFAS I will discuss later is basically as um, use of ultrasound to check for free fluid. And the more advanced imaging would be CT scan and MRI. You have another subject to discuss all of this, which is radiology, wherein you are going to um, learn how to do radiographs, how to do ultrasounds, and how it works, how it actually captures an image. And it's very good because the college has a digital x-ray now. So mas uh, safe, mas mabilis, at mas maganda ang quality ng x-ray na maproproduce nyo using that good, very good, very new 
digital radio, uh, radiograph sa college, right? So that's one thing to be excited about for us to be back in the college. So surgical risk assessment. This is just the second out of pre-op guidelines. Okay, surgical risk is the likelihood of a disease or a condition worsening um, or a possibility of death during the perioperative period. Okay, surgical risk. The surgical prognosis is basically the quantification of that risk. Okay. This is the prediction of the outcome of a surgical procedure based. Now, this is based on the history and your assessment of the health status of the animal using um, your findings from the physical exam and the diagnostic test. This is what you actually have to communicate to your client. What is the surgical risk the animal is facing for surgery? What is the, pos uh, the possible prognosis or the outcome of the surgery? What will, what will a surgery do to a patient's current health status? Will it improve it? Will it make it better? Or will it just be the same? All right. So you need to um, assess all these. But in emergency cases, which needs immediate surgical intervention, you already know the surgical risk is high. If you do not go into surgery immediately, you have to make the decision to skip the full pre-op assessment, physical exam, um, and all that to be able to provide the necessary treatment as possible. This is very important for those um, conditions, which are emergency surgical cases, active bleeders, um, gastric dilatation and volvulus or in a twist or uh, yung stomach, which needs to be corrected immediately. Um, what else? cesarean sections and such. So you don't need as much, uh, you don't need as much convincing with the surgical risk na clear siya for surgery because you know that if you do not do the surgery, this will die. That's the only reason that you need, okay? And that's the only uh, uh, convincing that you need uh, to do for the client, okay? If I don't do this, um, your, patient, your pet will die. If we wait, it will die. But if we do the surgery, it can die. But it can, it can live as well. Okay, That's the only ar argument that you have to do. So these are just guidelines for the prognosis. The prognosis is different from the health status. The physical status is 1 to 5. Prognosis is excellent to guarded. Right? So meron pa dito actually bago grave. There's a grave prognosis, which is worse than poor. <laughs> but um, basically, this is how you... Uh, communicated to the owners. Uh, the possibility of complications is, is not that much, but there is potential, but there is also a high probability of a good outcome. That's good, all right? So how you decide on the surgical prognosis is up to you. It's based on how you, uh, they call this, assess the patient during the pre-op evaluation. How thorough you were, what were the problems that you were, uh, that you saw during um, physical examination and what the diagnostic test revealed, that would be you, the data that you collate for you to decide what is the surgical prognosis for this animal. So for example, Bullet, he's actually five years old now. <laughs> this is my dog, right? For example, uh, Bullet comes in for a patellar luxation repair. The patella luxated from its normal position, you need to put it back, right? So... Um, you took a medical history and uh, you know a fast um, orthopedic physical examination. These are your findings. Okay, it's an aggressive dog house with two other dogs now four other dogs. Um, diet is stable, food and dry food. Updated vax and deworming uh, with yearly hardware preventive. Intermittent lameness on the right hind limb. The physical examination is unremarkable except for pain on right hind limb. You would see a lot of this na unremarkable or no significant findings. Yung wala naman silang nakitang ibang abnormal dun sa katawan no aso except for that thing that they pointed out, right? So you did a uh, vital check, right? Heart rate is 148, way high. Could be because of the pain, okay? RR is 40, temp 38.2. Uh, when you see WNL, which I love to use, all right? This means within normal limits, right? So the CBC and the biochem profile are within normal limits. Nothing is abnormal. So 
you could make a physical status of two, surgical prognosis of good. Now, for us, okay, you might think, bibigyan kami ni Doc ng case, tapos bahala kami, uh, kailangan namin identify ano yung physical status and prognosis. And then there's only one answer. No, no, there's not. You know, if I if we were colleagues already, you might think the physical status is three. I think the physical status is two. It doesn't actually change any of the surgical plan anyway. There's just a difference of opinion in how you actually assess the patient. Kaya lagi, pag nasa clinic or kapag may kaharap ka na na doctor, doc, na doctor ka din, colleague ka, yeah, this is a part of veterinary ethics, right? Because your experience and your uh, um, ability as a doctor, your knowledge, uh, fueled you to decide on a physical status of two. But the other colleagues' um, experience and knowledge as well made them decide um, on a physical status of three. No one's wrong. It's just a difference in opinion. But usually, yung difference nyong yon is just very small because you based it on the same thing. Okay. For urinary catheterization, this one is a blocked cat, right? The urethra is blocked. It was diagnosed with two, uh, with two years ago with kidney stones and renal insufficiency. So basically, a way worse than bullet earlier. Okay. Uh, physical examination showed a severely distended urinary bladder that you cannot express out the urine. It is alert and responsive, but you can see that it is very weak. You check the blood, you check the vitals, you see it's, it's actually uh, bad, right? You see elevated WBC, which could be indicative of infection, elevated renal enzymes and electrolyte, some electrolytes, which could point out um, or confirm its renal insufficiency diagnosis before. So again, your physical status as expected as compared to bullet earlier is much worse, right? And the surgical prognosis for this as well would be worse than bullet, okay? Now, all of these information need to be communicated to your client effectively and completely, right? Simula sa history, PE, all diagnostic tests done, you must relay it to the owner. And also, you also have to relay it to the owner because they're the ones who's gonna tell you if they're gonna go through with it or not. For example, you did your history. You checked the, uh, you did a physical exam, a fast physical exam. You decided to do CBC and biochem profile. You have to tell your the owner why. Because why? They're gonna be the ones to tell you, sure doc, go ahead, do whatever you need. Or they could also tell you, no, I don't want any tests done. You just want my money. So this is where the art of being a doctor, of just doing what's right. Um, what they call this? Na bumabangga siya dun sa capability mo to communicate. You're just as good as your communication skills when you're um, a, a doctor. All right? Especially a veterinarian. Kasi pagdating naman sa doctor ng tao, oo, lang tayo na oo. Diba? Pero pag uh, sa pets, you have to convince them with a heaven and hell um, tactics for them to understand. Now, not all clients are the same. Some are very easy to convince. Others um, are very well versed with medical terminologies that you have to go into the nitty gritty details of kidney insufficiency and um, your surgical plan before you could actually convince them. But the entire, uh, they call this, goal for you is for them to understand what is happening with their pet. For them to understand why you need to do what you're requesting for is for their pet. Para sa ikabubuti ng hayo. They might think it's, you know, it's extra expense and such. But again, um, the bottom line is you're doing your job it's for their own pet. And um, those people who are very willing to, to pay, horse owners for one. Number two, those with uh, you know some dog and cat owners. And you also have to see those clients na may experience yun naman to, yung tipong walang pera, pero maghahanap ng paraan para, uh, what they call this, para matulungan yung pet nila. Okay? That's also one, one thing why I don't like being an employee in a clinic because sometimes you're you're um you're tasked 
to to earn money kasi gota but gusto mo rin namang tumulong dun sa owner na wala masyadong pera kaya gusto mo rin magtipid na hindi mo naman kailangan gawin yung extra test so timplahin mo rin kung ano yung kung anong sino yung client na pipilitin mo sino yung hindi okay? so what are the things that you have to tell them diagnosis the if um the patient's diagnosis can be addressed surgically or non-surgically you have to give them those options you have to be honest about it the prognosis for every option san ano bang mangyayari sa kanya kapag synergy ano mangyayari kapag hindi hindi synergy the potential complications for the surgery how, how much care is uh, required post operatively and of course the best limiting factor the only limiting factor most of the time would be the cost how much would it cost the owner the farm owner you know the everyone else who's paying um how much will it set, set them back right so this ensures actually the the good outcome of your surgery whatever it may be right so for example we're almost done you have this patient don't ask me why why they're just uh taking a video of it and not helping it <laughs> When you see when I when I show you videos like this, you always check. Uh, you always be observant. What do you see? For one, I see that it's breathing wrong. It's labored breathing. Right. What else? I check the gums. It's pale. Look at how the saliva is. It's so. Uh, Dry. Dapat kasi ang saliva hindi naman yan ganyan ka mucoid. Yes, it is a little bit mucoid, but it's not that. Hindi yan ganyan dapat kalagkit. Right? You see the patient is breathing through, using the abdominal muscles already, meaning it's uh, in distress. Hindi na kaya ng thoracic cage lang niya ang huminga, pati abdominal muscles kasama. And it basically just became lethargic and recumbent. But it's still breathing. But what do you do first? Uh, I just gave it away. Damn animations. So I have choices. You could get a patient history. You could conduct a physical examination. You could perform your tests. You could proceed to surgery. This actually needs uh, surgery. It has bloat. I know that because I downloaded a video. But <laughs> um, so when you're, you're presented with this um, patient, your mind would undergo a lot of <laughs> judgments and decisions as to what you have to do, okay? Again, you have to do what is best for the patient. You don't know what that is until you stabilize it. When you see something wrong for, um, in a patient that needs immediate stabilization, you know there's something wrong with the breathing, you know there's something wrong um, with the hydration status, that it needs stabilization. It's not normal right now. It wouldn't live, uh, what do you call it? It wouldn't live um, any longer, okay? So you have to prioritize stabilization, okay? Before you actually do the surgery. Because if you don't stabilize, number one, if you don't stabilize before a surgery, your surgery might not um, work for the better of the patient. Number two, patient, patient stabilization methods actually help in producing a good outcome for your patient, right? So how, uh, why do we do this? Or to who do we do this? For healthy patients or those with mild to moderate conditions, these are some examples of that. Emergency patients, trauma patients, all right? These are some conditions, just some of conditions that you need to either restore function of a certain system, you need to support a system, a body system, before you go to surgery or before you identify what is the official diagnosis. Your physical exam can wait. Your history taking can wait. If you already see signs in your animal that it needs oxygen, give that oxygen. That is a part of patient stabilization. Okay, um, I learned this the hard way, of course, in, in my work as a tech because I didn't know what to do. The first thing that the doctor told me, stabilize it. 
stabilize it. I need it alive for me to do the other things, for me to do diagnostic tests, for me to identify what is wrong with it physically. I need it alive. Keep it alive. That's patient stabilization. Okay. So for trauma patients, this is the T fast or the A fast. Um, this is just a uh, utilization of uh, ultrasound to check for free fluid, which commonly happens with trauma. So patient stabilization are done to achieve two things, mainly. You replace or you support nutritional deficits, all right? Nutrition could be you know, any nutrition or even fluids. And you correct acid-base imbalances, okay? So how do we do this? Um, nutritional support, oxygen therapy, fluid therapy. Nutrition is commonly done um, as a patient stabilization for surgeries na alam mong hindi siya makakakain after, okay? That it cannot be restore its normal physiological digestive function immediately after surgery. So, pupurgahin mo siya ng nutritional support before. But, so, um, usually that's the only application of nutritional stabilization. But for oxygen therapy and fluid therapy, this is going to be our topics for next uh, week, all right? My favorite topic, actually, in <laughs> surgery one is fluid therapy, all right? So that is it for this lecture. Thank you so much for watching. Man, I said one hour. It's two hours. Sorry. I always, uh, we call this, lagi naman akong ganun. <laughs> over. So next week, oxygen therapy, fluid therapy, and fluid therapy includes blood transfusion as well. We are going to do a lot of computations. I hope two hours is enough. All right. So that is all for today. I hope you have a good week. And oh, it's Friday. Yeah. Have a good weekend. And um, I'll see you next week. All right. Bye. Thank you.